this week on Becoming Fearless. I was having like this very illogical argument with a woman I just started sleeping with. Even though she was yelling all this shit at me, I noticed like my cock was getting hard. And I was super nervous. Like I said this like stammering like, is your p- pussy wet? Like I had this like I didn't I didn't know where it came from, but I had this sense like I'm super aroused. I must be picking up something. And it turned out yeah, I was picking up something that she was totally blocking with her face, but I could feel it. And it seemed magical at the time. But now I realize this is just like like you said, dogs dogs don't have an analytical brain to our degree. So they're all they are is feeling. It's a large problem with men today because men have learned to become so loyal to the analytical mind that they've lost touch with just feeling the woman in front of them. Without words, without even like explicit gestures, mammals of a species can feel each other's emotions with near perfect accuracy. Humans have that mammal part of our brain, that limbic system. We can feel each other, but we think so much that we forget that we have this like seemingly magic ability, but it's just being a mammal. I was super anxious growing up. I was so quiet that my family would like openly joke that I was an autistic cousin because I would go like days without speaking. I used to do pickup stuff and used to like spend a lot of time cold approaching and now I look back like that's so ridiculous. I only approach if I feel something when I look at someone. If I I have my attention on a woman and I feel like some sort of warmth, I know she's going to say yes and there's no fear of rejection because I know, I already feel in her body that she wants me. You'll never feel like you're cold approaching. Like it'll always be a hot approach even if you're just meeting for the first time. If you can feel more, you'll get more ass, you'll have better sex, you'll like unleash your creativity, like just life will be better on every level. And like all the things that you are worried about, you realize it was never a problem. Welcome to Becoming Fearless. In this episode of Becoming Fearless, I interview a gentleman named Juan, who invited me to come speak at his, uh, his event, the Masculine Underground Symposium back in June. And I gotta admit, I was pretty impressed with what he pulled off. He had four weeks to put this event together. He's also really young. He's never put an event like this together and he hit it out of the park. So I want you to go ahead and really pay attention to what this uh, young man <laughs> has to say because in, his, in the few years he's, he's, uh, he's been around, because he is a lot younger than me, he's really pulled off a lot and I'm quite impressed. As always, remember, what would you do if you were not afraid? We just finished a long day of the very first uh, Masculine Underground Symposium, and it was actually a very successful day. And and Ruan pulled this off in like a moment's notice. Do this, what, in like four weeks? Yeah, not even, like three and a half weeks. And that's very impressive. Because I've seen people try to pull off more, or less, and by more time and still not succeed. We had a great day of learning about what it is to be a masculine man, a present mm-hmm. man, a feeling man, and Ruan was our first speaker. Yeah. You speak largely, what you were talking about today was, was really about getting out of your head and getting into feeling. Is that, is that how you would put it? Yeah, that's not a new concept. What I was really trying to bring in is like a, a very, for, for the analytical guys like myself, mm-hmm. like a really concrete model of what it means to feel. So like I broke down, you know, uh, like what is sensation? Like how can you feel more? Like put attention on your body and then moving up to emotion, intuition. As like not to create a formula, but something like very concrete because when like people tell analytical guys they need to feel more, sometimes it just goes right over their head. Like that even that concept, that word doesn't mean anything. It's an interesting point because I see I'll, I'll talk to analytical guys about feeling and they try to feel by anal- analyzing their way to feeling. Yeah. So that's the problem you're yeah. going into. Yeah, so I wanted to give them something for their attention to chew on while they learn to feel instinctually, either by themselves or with a coach. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting thing, because when I first met you, we, we met at a restaurant in LA, mm-hmm. and I noticed you had a, a nice depth of feeling. You were relating to me really well. Mm-hmm. I also noticed on stage today, when you were talking about all this, that um, you do have an analytical side. You totally. have a side that really loves to break all this stuff down and geek out and nerd out yeah, on it and, yeah. <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Is that why you love teaching guys? This? I guess so. I mean, I don't know. Um, well, like you, I was super anxious growing up. Like I was so quiet that my family would like openly joke that I was an autistic cousin because I would go like days without speaking. And I don't know if it's because of that or just like somehow related to that, but I was speaking in my head a lot. And a lot of times when I was speaking to myself or speaking to an imaginary person in my head, I was explaining things. And I mean, this is kind of like a roundabout story, but when I was a kid, I, I, was, I played music and that was like the way I could communicate. And we didn't have cable TV, so I would watch live music on late night uh, talk shows. So I'd watch 
Leno and Letterman, not because I cared about they did, but because I wanted to watch like the one uh, musical act at the end. Like that's what I obsessed over. And a after I like watched all these shows, I'd end up spending like the next four hours to like 4 a.m. having these imaginary conversations with Leno and Conan in my head. And I was always explaining something. It's not um, unlike me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot of that stuff. Yeah. I would have a lot of imaginary conversations, sometimes with people that weren't even real people, I think. Yeah. You ever see Man on the Moon, uh, the, th the Jim Carrey movie about Andy Kaufman? I didn't. I wanted to. I should have. Yeah. Well, that. they show scenes of him growing up where he would like put his face against the wall and like have like these two-hour um, like uh, comedy routines to an imaginary audience through the wall. Yeah. And like I totally did something like that. And Andy Kaufman was a tortured guy, and in a lot of ways, we came out of being tortured guys. Yeah. He didn't, unfortunately. Let's go back a little bit on this idea of feelings. We jumped right into it. For guys out there watching, why is this even important? That if they're sitting there going, "I just want to get a girl. I don't care about feeling," or "I just want to get a." be more confident, I don't care about feeling. Why is this idea so important? Yeah, well to start, I mean, everything is like a scale from subtle to gross, and to start with the gross, because that's the easiest to digest, um, to like put it very bluntly, if you can feel more, you'll get more ass, you'll have better sex, you'll like unleash your creativity, like just life will be better on every level, and like all the things that you are worried about caused by your analysis will like I don't want to say cured, because once you get there, you, don't, you realize it was never a problem. There's a million analogies down the rabbit hole, breaking the matrix, whatever, but like you enter a whole nother realm of existence that is not like just the material realm. Like there's something going on between you and I right now. There's something going on with between us and the people who are going to watch this later. Like that's, I mean, you call it energy. I just call it feeling because it's a very um, relatable word. That whole like network exists like beneath or deeper than the material world that we just look at and interact with mechanically. So that's like the gross answer, like your life will be better. And I can picture guys on the other end going, well, this is, sound, this is starting to sound really woo-woo or this is starting to sound really out there. And I want them to get that this is not as woo-woo as you think and that this is really important if they want to grasp this part of their life. If they really want a serious change, you should really listen to this. And so what's your take on that? Yeah, well, I come from a super skeptical background. Like both of my parents are a physics professor and I see things very um, logically. And like when I started learning like these like more mystical woo woo things, I like, rejected things left and right. And uh, actually one of the other speakers uh, who was my teacher too, Ken Blackman, um, he got into my head, and this is not, this is not answering your question yet, but he got into my head that like the real experience that you want to get doesn't necessarily come from having an explanation. So that's one thing, like you don't need to explain it in order to um, get the benefit. So even if it is like placebo or self-fulfilling prophecy, like who cares? Like if I believe that my magic bean is gonna get me laid and I do all the actual things that are make, make me confident and you know do all the things perfectly that is attractive, who cares if the magic bean is like full of shit? Like, yeah. I mean, in, in a sense, you don't wanna be hosed, but like that's like- You're the saying angle. the bean gave you the confidence to do all these things perfectly. Yeah, and obviously the bean didn't do it, but who cares? To your point about, uh, Everything that seems woo-woo and mystical has some sort of explanation. And if you can accept that there's an explanation that we can't explain yet, you'll just, you'll progress so much further. Like so many things that were considered magic, science eventually caught up to explain. So like when you feel the energy of a person, what does that mean? Maybe someday we'll have a technology to like track, you know, biofeedback or something. In positive psychology, which is a newer movement or a new branch of psychology, um, they call it positive inception. Mm -hmm. The ability to feel somebody else's emotions while you're talking to them or to motivate other people mm -hmm. and get them to feel your emotions. And so they're already studying it. I don't know if they've got you know, logical explanations for it, but if you look at animals, they study animals too. How does a dog know another dog is angry? It doesn't tell him, he feels it. He feels the yeah. emotion. Or how does a gazelle know the lion's out to eat right now? Yeah. Which is just lounging. And it's like whatever model you want to use. I mean, this has actually been documented in a great book to read, General Theory of Love. It's written by a bunch of psychiatrists and they talk about this concept called limbic resonance, which is basically what you're talking about. Like without words, without even like explicit gestures, mammals of a species can feel each other's emotions with near perfect accuracy. Yeah. So the survival um, benefit is like if there's a pride of meerkats and like one gets eaten by a, I don't know, what the predator is a hawk, and then all the meerkats didn't even see that happen, but they feel fear in their body, so they hide. Like, that's a huge benefit. So humans have that mammal part of our brain, that limbic system, 
we can feel each other, but we think so much that we forget that we have this like seemingly magic ability, but it's just being a mammal. Like your emotions will sync with everyone around you if you're open to it. I would bet that that would almost seem normal if we didn't have this strong analytical mind. Yeah. And uh, it would be a given. Like, oh yeah, we can all feel each other's emotions. It seems super trippy. Like I remember like when I first started training in this stuff a few years ago, I was having like this very illogical argument with a woman I just started sleeping with. Like it's one of those things like, why is she mad about this? This is so stupid. Even though she was yelling all this shit at me, I noticed like my cock was getting hard and I was super nervous. Like I said, this like stammering, like, is your p pussy wet? Like I had this, like, I didn't, I didn't know where it came from, but I had this sense, like I'm super aroused. I must be picking up something. And it turned out, yeah, I was picking up something that she was totally blocking with her face, but I could feel it. And it seemed magical at the time. But now I realize this is just like, like you said, dogs, dogs don't have an analytical brain to our degree. So they're all they are is feeling. That's why dogs yeah. can feel men so easily. I think it's a large problem with men today because men have learned to become so loyal to the analytical mm -hmm. mind that they've lost touch with just feeling the woman in front of them. Fuck, she's turned on. She wants to get fucked right now. Yeah. Or she wants me to hit on her. Or she doesn't want me to hit on her, but you know what? I'm going to feel into this and see if she can feel me because she doesn't even know I'm here. It's like she doesn't know I'm standing here. I'm going to go say hi and feel her. Yeah. Versus listen to every and look word she says. You know, everybody loves to talk about say this, do this, say this. But you're talking about feel this, feel that with women. Would you say mm -hmm. this is the key to becoming really powerful with women, powerful yeah. with men? It's tricky because like the reason why we uh, cherish the analytical mind is that it's very clear cut. Whereas your feelings are so vague, like you can't like like someone else spoke about this today you can't assume anyone wants to fuck you just because you have a boner when you look at them like is it is it just your heart on or are you are you picking up on something so it takes a lot of practice and like like micro calibrating until the point you can trust like those feelings i used to do pickup stuff and used to like spend a lot of time cold approaching and now i look back like that's so ridiculous that i would like spend time approaching women that just weren't like when there were other women there that totally wanted wanted me and now I only approach it doesn't feel like a cold approach I only approach if I feel something when I look at someone yeah. if, if I have my attention on a woman and I feel like some sort of warmth I know she's gonna say yes and there's no fear of rejection because I know I already feel in her body that she wants me so what you're talking about is something I've been talking a lot about lately a lot of guys think it's I either have to approach women or do online dating how else would you meet a woman mm -hmm. and this goes into this they can't feel if you could feel into women, you can feel women as they walk by, you can open your emotions and feel people in general. How does this change the whole meeting women? It's not a direct approach anymore. It is literally, there's what goes on that causes you to, like say I'm going out to a bar tonight and I'm really good at this. Mm -hmm. How would I, how would I, how would that be different for me? How would the journey to meeting a woman at the bar, or the mall or wherever be different? The interaction, the relationship like occurs way before you guys even look at each other. Like that feeling, like this feeling sense, whether you want to look at it woo-woo or not, you could, like, you know, you could justify it with mirror neurons if you need to, but like it happens way before you consciously recognize a person. Like in my presentation today, I talked about how sex occurs with clothes on way before you're even engaged and like you're always like, like fucking everything in a sense. Yeah. Like if you can have like your feelers out and like be conscious of your environment. You spoke today about how like colors give you a feeling like what is what does this chair make me feel as opposed to your chair like there, there's these they're super subtle but there is a difference and like if you can become aware of that you might just be you know on your computer like drinking a cup of coffee and you just you feel a zing i don't know why my attention is drawn this way but i'm looking oh there's a really hot woman in a dress or whatever there's a reason why i looked at her she's probably you know feeling something for me like it's like almost like the a, like a tiger being in heat or the mating call like it just happens so subtly that you have to be sensitive to like like especially in a, a city like new york where we're at right now like there's women in heat like all over the place if you can like recognize that heat. you'll never i don't know if that's, I that's mean, a good feminist book, be mad at me or a good book title i don't care <laughs> i'll use it for something yeah um like you'll never feel like you're cold approaching. Like it'll always be a hot approach, even if you're just meeting for the first time. It's a neat idea. It's not even a concept, it's reality as yeah. far as I'm concerned. I had a really rough time in high school and I, you know, I was super depressed, I was suicidal, and I started lifting weights as a way to get out of that. And the guy who I was lifting weights with was obsessed with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He ended up becoming a bodybuilder, this guy. 
um, and we watched Pumping Iron when we were 16. And the, there was that clip of him like, being like, I'm coming, I'm coming in the gym, I'm coming mm-hmm. when I'm on stage. And I was like, that's such a neat concept. Like, I'm not become, gonna become a bodybuilder, but what if I could be like in orgasm all the time? And that became like an ideal, that was deep in my head. And eventually I found one taste and was working for them for a while and that, that was like, wow, that's bizarre. That's the exact term they yeah. I, I mean, Turned yeah. on for life, but, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. It's just so people understand, guys understand, because mm-hmm. they may not understand the difference between what they're calling orgasm or what you're calling orgasm or what yeah well what that may the traditional both. i mean the mm-hmm. traditional term of orgasm what's the difference yeah i mean like arnold and one taste both uh like, orgasm is not an event to them it's a state like a state of high sensation like where you're totally feeling yourself and the other person and i would expand that to being like your environment like when you're yeah. so in your body that like you're fucking the wall just by looking at it or a painting or whatever. This wasn't the best example, but like that level of engagement with your reality and it feels so good. So like the the concept of like getting naked with a woman and putting your cock in here doesn't seem like that big a jump if you're living in that state all the time. Oh, I agree. It's just like it's just like going to another room in your house. Like this is the vagina room. Like yeah. but the other room is just as exciting. And it should be that normal. Yeah. It should be healthy, normal and something that people do, that adults do, you know. Because it's good for you. It's good. There's so many levels it's good for you. As I've gotten better with women over the years, I remember when I used to approach a lot, mm-hmm. all I approaching. And then I never really did much internet dating. And then one day I just realized I didn't really need to approach anymore. Women in my mind just showed up. Mm-hmm. I just started seeing them everywhere. I could feel them. I'd bump into a girl walking my dog. I'd bump into And it wasn't really an approach. It was more like a dance that we just kind of ended up together. Have you noticed when you're walking down the street or you're walking through something and there's a girl that walks by and you, she doesn't look at you at all, but you can feel her. Mm -hmm. Like her awareness is on you. She's paying attention to you. She's curious and you can feel it. It's almost calling you, even though you don't even make her eye contact. And have you had that experience? You ever played with that? Totally. I feel like this pang of regret when you talk about that, because like it makes me remember like the hundreds of times growing up where like, women were giving me this like loud signal I want you to talk to me maybe they weren't even aware of it but there was like this thing like I for some reason was like looking at them a lot or my attention was drawn that way but I didn't know how to know how to realize that that was like their mating call almost yeah. and like I like I, I I mean no matter how many women I experience how many women I sleep with or date like I for some reason I will always regret my adolescence wasted but whatever I've got the same regrets I've yeah. girls that were so blatant they were hitting me over the head with a club and I'm yeah. sitting there nice guy syndrome I don't want to move don't want to upset her don't want to piss her off because you've yeah. gone from the whole nice guy mm-hmm. analytical what's your take on all that when it especially with the feeling sense what's your take on women and sex in general and men wanting sex men being turned on when they look at them a lot of men think they need to ask permission. There's the conversation that's happening explicitly, like the material, superficial conversation, and then there's like the sensation conversation that's happening under, underneath. And if you can feel that, like that's the more interesting conversation, where you see a woman in a store, or you don't even look at her, but like you're kind of like talking to each other, even though like you're not like looking, but like something's going on. The fact that you're thinking about her while you're pretending to fold clothes or whatever, like she's doing something too, and like. If you try to go off of like superficial cues, like how many times did she touch her hair or look at me, like you're always going to be reading it wrong. Yeah. But it, because it's so simple. The fact that your attention is drawn to her, trust that for like, it's, it takes practice because you have to go through a progression. And I think what you're pointing at is like this feeling of scarcity causes this. And I'm not immune to rejection by any means. Like no, none of us are, no matter how like, like, I made it seem like, oh, I know every time a woman's gonna like say yes to me. It's not totally accurate, but it's accurate enough that I can trust my sense when it when it happens. And when you're in a state of abundance, you don't care if like one out of ten, or it doesn't even matter what the, the odds are and numbers are. Like you don't. It's like that's part of the game too. The progression I went through, where um, when you're in scarcity, a, a man wants to fuck every opportunity he can get, and if he like messes a chance, he feels like shit. Whereas like once you start approaching um, more abundance and like you're, you're chasing, uh, you go through a stage where you're chasing tail just for the sake of it, like to make up for your woeful adolescence or whatever. But then you get to a place where like you realize, oh, I actually have as much ass and connection and love and relationships as I want. And I could actually say no when it's in my environment if I'm not hungry. Like when you're not starving, you don't have to eat every meal. By the same token, you can get ass as you put it and not get fed at all. 
Yeah. And a lot, I think a lot of guys, that's why they keep chasing, because they're not getting fed. They might fuck 100 girls. Yeah. And not get, and none of them fed Empty them. calories. Empty calories, yeah. yeah. For guys out there that are going, what the fuck does that mean? Can you explain that? Yeah, um, oh, I'll tell it's like a pretty vulnerable thing, but I've said this a few times. I was like studying all these self-improvement methods. I read the four hour work week, it was my Bible of like how to be efficient in life and relationships and in uh, you know business and my hobbies, working out. And I applied it to dating. And I went at it from a, such an analytical place and I did all the things right. So I was dating a lot. I had just moved to New York City. I was, you know, in my early 20s I in a sweet pad. I was dating all these women. And I had these women who did want to have sex with me because I was doing things right by the book. I was following all these formulas and I could not get it up. Like every time I brought a woman home, I had this streak, like this hot streak where I was bringing girls home like every weekend and none, none, like, I could never get it up. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? Like, I'm in great shape. I'm, you know, 23 years old. Like, this is ridiculous. That's it was, gotta be really frustrating too. It was humiliating. It was like, it was like, I just wanted to be celibate or, you know, like it was, it was, it was insane. But then I, you know, all it was, and I don't want to, you know, put it down, but it was me unwilling to feel what I was feeling. So it's going from this like very like superficial heady role I was cutting off of my, cutting off my soul. In, this, in a sense. I went through a phase of taking Viagra. Don't do it. Like, it's like, it'll give you the results, but you'll never feel satiated. I was having a lot of sex for a period that was so unsatiating. Like I would have sex, I would feel like masturbating still because it was so like ungratifying. When I first started having sex, I was so in my head mm -hmm. that the sex, I could hardly feel the girl. I was fucking, but I'm not feeling anything. I'm yeah. like, this girl's really hot too. And I really wanted to fuck her. I could feel more from masturbating to porn than I could fucking a girl. Yeah. And that was really frustrating. It was it really pissed me off in a lot of ways. Yeah, because it's an, an unwillingness to feel another yeah. person. Like that's like, that's intimacy, like the willingness to feel yeah. and be felt. I coach a lot of women and um, there's a lot of women who can climax on their own but don't climax with a partner. Like I, I've met all these women like in their 50s or 40s mm -hmm. who like went their entire lives like never being able to climax in the presence of a man. And it's because you're afraid these people, same thing with men or, or us in the past, like being unwilling to have ourselves felt because that's what connection is. The thing you really want, the satiating piece of sex is connection. It's not coming in a condom. For guys out there, this, this may sound crazy because I know some guys are out there going, but I just, I, no, I really do want to get laid. You're going to find if you actually succeed at getting laid without connection that pretty soon you feel even shittier. And that's yeah. the hard part to get. So with connection comes from what I've seen, Vulnerability. What's the difference between vulnerability, in your opinion, and just being plain needy? Because I think a lot of men associate vulnerability. I don't want to be vulnerable. It's needy. It's weak. I was super against vulnerability during like the Viagra era. Like they were very much linked. Viagra era. Yeah. All era. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it was a while. It's like a year. The way I eventually got out of it, I was doing different body-based practices. But the real thing that got me like off of Viagra and like having normal and eventually amazing sex was this willingness to like admit. To women when I was in bed with them like listen I have this like issue and I like, just like saying it and like it was so humiliating to say that especially with a woman who wanted to sleep with me but it was also freeing like every time I said it or shared it with someone like a layer of wall was being taken off of me and mm. eventually like I was so like cleaned off and I was just, you know this, this wasn't the only place I was being vulnerable but it was, it was a big piece for me Eventually, like I could suddenly feel my body again. The bastardized version of that, or the you know perverse version of that, is when guys like I don't want to keep dumping on like new agey guys, but like they realize vulnerability is important. It's like cherished in like the post-feminist world, and they use it over and over and over again because they think that'll give them validation. If you're doing it because like something needs to come out of your soul that needs to be expressed because you've been hiding yourself from the world because you have a thing you're ashamed of or whatever, like that's powerful vulnerability that's gonna make you feel more and be connected to people and then get all these things like relationships and sex or whatever on a fulfilling level. Whereas if you're doing it for validation, like that's the neediness and you're actually putting up another wall where like, you're like, like this facade, I was, I was, I was vulnerable for you, please like me, as opposed to like, this is me, that's yeah. the difference. It's, it's a, and it's a big difference. I always say vulnerability is confidence. The only way you can share all that and not ask her to validate you back, not ask for anything in return, not require her to make you feel good about it and just be okay with sharing and leaving it and that's it. This is my truth. You have to be confident. Totally. And if you're not, it's gonna develop it. It's yeah. gonna, and it's gonna build utter confidence in you and that's, that's uber attractive.
And then what's vulnerable now someday will be nothing, and then they'll have the only layer of vulnerability. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because it's the it's the real way to heal shame. All your social issues, whether you consider them issues or not, anything that's keeping you from your full self is related to some sort of shame. Like we all have it. Like you're not, maybe you'll never be free of it in this lifetime, but like you can get a, a ton of shit out of the way if you're just willing to be vulnerable. So on that note, do you practice the whole idea of step into embarrassment or shame daily? I don't know if I do it daily. Um, I definitely, you know, if I hear, I mean, I'm using a metaphor, but if I hear the voice, there's something I need to say out loud. Mm-hmm. I know I'm going to feel like crap if I don't say it. Like I've done this enough times that I, even if it's super uncomfortable to admit something or fess up to something or, you know, call someone out, it's vulnerable to say to someone, I think you're a fucking asshole, you know, like that's vulnerable too. Like it's a thing that would make you potentially not liked. You know, those things, when I say them, I know I'm going to feel better. And there's a difference between the way you just said it and the way a lot of guys say it. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys say it out of reactiveness, rage, and anger. What you just did was say it from a whole different place. You said it from a more proactive place. Yeah, I think it's also like knowing that like, if I think someone's an asshole, it doesn't mean they're an asshole. Like I have enough sense to know even if I'm like, even if I am like in a semi-reactive phase where like I just want to like slit a throat or something, like... I can just say I want to slit your throat and it doesn't mean I'm actually going to like there's nothing binding in my emotions but I can express that and then it's out of the way I'm like oh yeah you know you'd be surprised especially with women how quickly like an emotional state will be cleared if you just say the right thing you can go from livid to joyous in a second yeah the feminine works a lot in the moment yeah forgets the next moment I I hate you in one moment in the next moment love you to death yeah I see a lot of guys get new agey and they start working on being good with women they become loyal to the moment Mm -hmm. the now being present going with the flow what does the moment want me to do but but so much so that they throw out all structure and Mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like you've done that it sounds like you're still you're 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 health in a healthy way combining the two yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a definitely a work in progress because I definitely started with a super hyper-masculine linear, like I have a military background, like I was very structured, and that didn't work out for mm-hmm. me. And then I spent all this time studying or, like female orgasm and spending a lot of time with women and a lot of women teachers, and that's great too, and I went super in the other end. I went pretty deep. I didn't consider myself new agey, but I definitely was like too in like moment to moment sometimes. Too much like a goldfish. That marriage is what's what life is about. I think it is. I think yeah. that's where happiness is found. People know me as somebody who's always working on being present or the moment, listening to the moment, and being in my now. But I also said we also, in my company, collect all the data. Mm-hmm. We look at every piece of the data, statistics, numbers, all this stuff. And this, and this guy said to me, well, that doesn't sound like very like you're being very present. I said, no, it is. I want all the data. Then I read it, I take it in, and then I let my gut just tell me what to do with that data. It has numbers to crunch, not my head, my gut. Yeah, when people get too dogmatic, like, oh, I can't deal with numbers because I'm a present man. Like, it's funny because, like, if you look back in history, like, I, I don't know if this is the right investor, but George Soros, I believe, super famous investor, they found out through his son that he made some of his biggest, like, most celebrated seven figure Wall Street deals, like, by looking at financials. Not even reading them, but like just looking at them. And if, if if he felt sick, he would sell. And if he felt excited, he would buy. And that's mm-hmm. how he did his like, you know, that's how he built his empire. The very first time I played um, um, craps, mm-hmm. I just got on the table and that's all I did. If I felt really uncomfortable, I'd move it off. I kept <laughs> winning. All. And then I said, once I won a bunch of money, I said, now I, I got cocky and confident. And I said, oh, I got this game wired. And I think I went into my head, lost it all. Huh. But I remember that whole ride. It was all based on how I felt in my body. It takes a lot of faith. I mean, people don't live moment to moment for real because you have to trust that in the next moment, you'll see the right thing to do and you'll behave in the right way yeah. and the circumstances will meet you. Now, Branson is a guy I love a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you read his book, uh, Losing My Virginity, a great book, autobiography. Mm-hmm. He was dyslexic, and he is dyslexic, I shouldn't say was. Mm-hmm. And he talks a lot about making most of his decisions from his gut. And he says, yeah, we, we crunch all the statistics, the numbers, but he says, I, I don't really understand them mm-hmm. that well. And he says, if I listened to everybody that gave me all those statistics and numbers all the time, I wouldn't be where I'm at. My gut has really guided me big time. And I love covering this today because for these guys out here, in my opinion, if they're really doing their work, it's not all about women. Mm -hmm. It's about so much more. It's about stepping into their power with their businesses or their jobs or their uh, whatever they're creating in their life, their passion. It could be any number of these things. So, um, So can you give from your experience 
any pointers on how they can really develop that relationship, like a practice or a technique or something they just go out and play with, to give them some familiarity with their gut, especially if they're in their head or used to being in their head. As far as feeling goes, like feeling, I, I spoke about this today, exists on three levels, sensation, emotions, and intuition. Sensation is the most concrete. Like you can't argue sensation. Yeah. If something's hot, it's hot. If something is, if a, if a pussy's wet, it's wet. Like you can't argue like, no, your, yeah. your pussy's wet, I see it. You can't tell me you're not turned on. And I mean, that's the place to start. Like really, fo like your body is the most concrete vehicle to getting in touch with feeling and noticing like how your body feels when you have attention. Instinct is the basically the sum of your behaviors you can't control. And we want to unleash those because that's where good sex and creativity comes from. Um, amongst other things, survival. And attention is the only thing you can really consciously control. So almost any practice where you're using your attention to get sensational feedback will train that muscle. And then you can work from sensation to emotion to intuition. Even something like cold approaching, that's a practice that if done mindfully will give you great results, which is why some guys do it really well. But it's like you're doing it in a way where you're actually getting your sensory feedback as opposed to just trying to rack up numbers or superficial results. I have literally taken clients who couldn't feel hardly at all out to just like, I pull out two sheets of color and like mm -hmm. I talked about, I literally do that. What's the difference between these two colors in your body? Can you feel the difference? Mm -hmm. And versus no. I bring somebody else who could, like bring four or five people who could. Now you see these four or five people can. Oh really? Now they're shocked, they're puzzled. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference and then they start sitting a little bit. I think I can. And it's really getting past their own self-doubt. Yeah. And then I would say, do you feel the difference between looking at this tree, which is right in front of you, and looking off into the distance? How does it feel different in your body? Yeah. I'll say to that, um, it's, it's not that they don't feel it. It's like that they, they he, like kind of, you said they, he, they feel it, but they don't, they discount it immediately. Exactly. But like, if you can just trust, like random word association is a great place to start, I think, because words are easy to deal with. Like think of a word, like what word pops into your head when you look at white? sheet, I don't know, it doesn't matter, like whatever that random mm -hmm. thing that comes to you, that is a very valid word. It's a very yeah. valid feeling. Like if you feel an itch because you looked at red, trust that itch means something. You can figure out the deep meaning of the universe later, but just trust like, I felt a gurgle in my throat when I looked at white, like, whatever. I mean, yeah. start with that because that'll build into something that you can really concretely feel if you can give validation to your own random impulses even if they're off and if you do that really well now you're starting to get into the land of how women think yeah you're starting to understand how they think you don't have to yeah. become them but you start to be able to understand that women are changing from moment to moment to moment so that that ability that you're talking about doing that is yeah. giving you an insight yeah a really funny thing like years ago when i would be in bed with a woman like she would want to like set the mood lighting and there had to be music and like if i to me it didn't make a difference like whatever, fluorescent lights, I don't give a shit. We're not, you know, we're not here to fuck the room, but like we are there to fuck the room. Yeah. And like women are more attuned to that. We're like, my girlfriend, finally, I just turned 27, I finally make my bed. I had never made my bed because I thought it was such a waste of time. Um, but I've realized like you're, I mean, this is, this is a very woo, woo way to say it, but like there's a different energy signature with a made bed versus an unmade bed. To say it more like, you know, less woo woo way, like you get, experience a different feeling from an organized um, set of sheets to a disorganized set of sheets. And if you organize in a way and put your attention in a way that it feels good, that's like freeing attention in your mind to be creative, to like have more energy. Your room will feel better immediately if you make yeah. your bed. And that surprises me coming from a military guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I made it when I was in OCS, but then I, I, I was like, oh, this is dumb. Like, there's yeah, no what's sergeant. The point? You should get here. back into it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to think like that. Yeah. But then, you know, you're right. It does feel different. It not only feels different, it's just the mere fact that really successful people tend to make their beds. This yeah. idea of feeling, connecting women, vulnerability, anything in that whole area we just talked about that, that, I, that you think is important, you want to add to anything we've said. For one, for the analytical guys, like this is something I would have liked to have heard a few years ago. If you're analytical, chances are you're, you're atheistic and have like a, or maybe nihilistic or whatever. Just pick something, pick anything that will make random feelings make sense. If you want to believe in energy, believe in energy. If you want to believe in like, you know, spirit fairies or a cupid, like it doesn't matter. Just pick something, just so you have like a mental model of what does it mean when I feel something, when I look at a tree or look at tits or like, okay. and it just anything to like give your mind something to chew on, because that'll be enough to get your mind out of the way. And then you can just engage and be like the animal that you are.
Nice. I like that. Yeah. Let's jump back a little bit to the symposium. Mm -hmm. You put on a one day symposium this mm -hmm. time and it, it turned out great, by the way. We had a lot of great speakers and you're going to be putting on some more in the future. Or are you looking, thinking about doing another one? Yeah. Um, I mean, like you said, it, it was put together in a few weeks. I was just going to bring in one speaker to talk to the few guys I knew. And then I was like, oh, well, let's add another speaker. And then like with like three and a half weeks up until the date, we were like, oh shit, no, we're actually putting on a full day event. A, a little background about the event. like. I really did not want to mass market something to everyone. Like I wanted like a really high quality group of guys so that we could bring in speakers like Brian and the other speakers and like go really deep with them. Like I, not that there's anything wrong with beginner level programs, but I, I personally I'm just bored with it. I don't want to solve people's problems. Like get up to good and then we'll talk. Like at least that's where I'm at right now. And I wanted like that kind of caliber. So we had an invite only event where we invited people individually. So I spent one day emailing a bunch of guys after like six hours, no one responded. I'm like, fuck, we're gonna, I'm gonna get to call Brian and say, cancel your plane ticket. We're gonna get our deposit back, like we're done. And then so, like one guy bought a ticket. And I'm like, fuck, well now we have to do it. So then we hustled, then we got we got a full room. Oh, yeah, you yeah. did, you did very well. Yeah. And uh, I'm, you're probably glad that guy bought a ticket. Right? Yeah, no, I thanked him today. Because yeah. if he didn't, I would have just canceled it that afternoon probably. So you're looking at another one probably, you said in the fall. Probably in the fall, yeah. Okay, and there's no set concrete plans yet, but you, you hear this is invite only. Yeah. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep you guys informed. And, 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 and I'm curious what you consider somebody with, what were the words you used? There's actually a mix of experience in the room, but I wanted it to be so that it's guys who are conscious enough or have le reached a level of thinking where they don't need to be spoon fed uh -huh. and they won't like be the caboose in the room, like where they will like be dragging everything down or they've worked through like their basic level shit where they won't be triggered by a BDSM demo or they won't like judge some talk about energetics or something like Guys who've experienced the world or at least have a conception that there's more out there and can actually absorb advanced level content yeah, and yeah. implement it. And are you keeping the website up so people can check it out in the meantime or um, do you want? Yeah, uh, masculineunderground.com. Keep an eye out for this next event. So I wanna uh, thank you for coming over. We're over, by the way, if it looks funny, we're over at the hotel room after the event. Yeah. We just had to kind of make something work because he's busy for the next few weeks. I'm flying back to California. So I wanna thank you for coming over to the hotel room to do this. I'm totally. sure that everybody's gonna get a lot of value out of it. Yeah. Check out the website. Thank you so much. And uh, you can check out uh, my stuff at ruanamipagala.com. R-U-W-A-N-M-E-E-P-A-G-A-L-A. -E -E I know it's a lot, but that's my name. We'll hopefully see you at the next event. Totally. And some of these guys will too. See yeah. you guys there. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Becoming Fearless with, with Ruan from the Masculine Underground Symposium. If you have any questions from the episode, make sure to comment below and we'll make sure to reply to your comments. We look at all of them. So if it's your first time listening to the Becoming Fearless podcast, make sure to subscribe by hitting the subscribe button. And thank you again for joining me in this episode of Becoming Fearless. And remember, only the confident live. Settle the brain back down, almost like a trance or a meditative state, relax, which I actually say creates more presence. It's an indifference to outcome. Do I like you? What's beautiful about you? What do I like about you?